So we are going to dive into the forensic science behind God's fingerprint design today, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, but I always like to start with God's word, perfect and true. You know, Psalms 139, 14 tells us, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. And especially when we look at the topic of forensic science as a scientific discipline, there are multiple different areas in forensic science that you can work in. So if we take a look at this, you're going to see multiple areas. Now, this is not all inclusive of all the different specialities there are in forensic science. And if you love to watch those fictional crime scene shows, uh, it, they make it appear that when someone works in the crime scene unit, they're an expert in all 20 disciplines of forensic science. But that is just not reality. Uh, when I was working in the crime scene unit, the closest area that resembled my specialty was latent print and ID. I was a fingerprint expert uh, and have still study fingerprint patterns today, and that's going to be the focus of this talk today. But if we first take a look at, well, what is forensic science? Well, if we were going to define it, we would say that it applies current observational methods to historical events. All right, so let's think about this. Was a crime scene uh, investigator who arrives on the scene present when the crime occurred, did they visibly view you know, what happened? Well, no, right? They're arriving on a scene that has happened in the past. They're going to use current observational methods to collect evidence and to make an analysis, but they didn't actually see that crime occur. So let's look at the difference between observational science and historical science. Have you ever heard this? Billions of years ago, there was an explosion in space, or 100,000 years ago, this happened, or that happened, or even in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Question. How does anyone know? I mean, was anybody there to observe it? Well, actually somebody was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Check this out. First of all, we need to recognize that there is a huge difference between observational science and historical science. Both are valuable, but very different. Let's define the two real quick, shall we? Observational science is simply when we observe something and experiment to draw conclusions. It involves repeatable experimentation and observations in the present. It's through observational science that we find cures for diseases and build space shuttles, stuff like that. Now, through historical science, we consider things that happened in the past, but they cannot be checked in the same way. I mean, we don't have access to the past like we do the present because, well, it's gone, right? All we really have is speculation, or at best, circumstantial evidences of past events based on what we see in the present. That's not to say that we can't make intelligent guesses about the past or form reasonable inferences from rocks or fossils in the present, but we certainly cannot directly test our conclusions because we cannot repeat the past. Got it? So, does that mean historical science is unimportant? Not at all. Let's all right, so if we look at the difference between observational and historical science, observational science or operational science is something that is observable, testable, and repeatable, right? Very important in the field of forensic science. Using those observable, testable, repeatable methods, we will then apply it to something that happened to the past, right? Which is historical science or origin science. Looking at evidence that is unobservable in its original form, right? And making an analysis or interpretation of that. And we look, when we talk about forensic science and crime scenes. Imagine you arrive on a crime scene, but you did not see that crime occur. So you have to make an inference, right? You have to make assumptions about what may have occurred in the past. So when we look at observational, applying it to forensic science, this could include fingerprint analysis by collecting a fingerprint at a crime scene and taking it back and trying to compare it to databases. It can include DNA fingerprinting, where we you know, take a DNA sample through the process of electrophoresis and create a DNA fingerprint and are able to search that as well. It can also include footwear impressions or tire track impressions and trying to compare those to a, you know, a suspect. And it can also include trace analysis, which does involve hair. Right? We find hairs at a crime scene and we're able to look at that microscopically and then try to make a match to possible suspects. All of this would be considered observational science, but these conclusions would then be have to apply to something that happened in the past. So if we take a look at historical science, all right, imagine that you know, you're looking at evidence from the past, or as here you can see fossils from the past, but depending on a scientist's worldview or even their expertise, they can come to different conclusions about that evidence. So if we take a look at it from a crime scene perspective, two scientists can arrive on a crime scene and you know, they can come to two different conclusions based on their observational science. Mistakes can be made, right? Because man is sinful and we are not perfect and we can make mistakes. So forensic science is inherently a 
historical science. All right, so when we look at that, that is basically because the past is not observable. We cannot go back into the past and look at exactly what occurred in real time. The past is also not predictable, and therefore it is subject to interpretation. And it is impossible to recreate the past. Uh, there are many times, and you may have even seen this on TV, where they'll actually bring the entire crime scene uh, into the courtroom and try to recreate it for the jury. Or sometimes they'll actually take the jury out to the crime scene and try to you know, let them experience what may have occurred there. But it's still not the same. We cannot recreate what occurred, right? It's something that happened in the past. And therefore, interpretations can be incorrect. Uh, Thomas Young actually went on to say, one cannot design an experiment that will replicate the complex variety of conditions that exist in the past, conditions that are often not known in full detail. So forensic science is a historical science. So because mistakes can be made, there actually is an organization, the National Registry of Exonerations, whose goal is to now, as technology improves and our, D our understanding of DNA has drastically improved, to go back and test evidence again and see if mistakes have been made. And they have actually started this since 1989, and you can actually see all the exonerations by years since then of people that were found uh, to be serving time uh, on a guilty verdict that were actually not guilty because our understanding of technology and DNA processing has improved. So you can see, as of 2019, 73 people as of June 24th have been exonerated uh, for crimes they were not guilty of. So just as the forensic scientists can make mistakes about the evidence that they interpret, so can geologists when they look at fossil evidence, right? Mistakes can be made when we interpret evidence, and it largely has to do with your worldview. So the field that I worked in was actually called dactyloscopy, which is the study of fingerprints. Uh, I was actually introduced to this science at a very young age because my father uh, was an expert in the field himself for over 30 years. He was the supervisor of Miami Days Police Fingerprint um, Identification Unit. Uh, and so while I was little, I remember him bringing fingerprints and starting to teach me how to classify those fingerprint patterns. I still have my fingerprint card from 1982 when he took my fingerprints. Uh, and I started started to learn understand those patterns. So it wasn't surprising that I, uh, when I grew up, my first professional job was working in the crime scene unit in the same field. So if we were going to define what a fingerprint is, we would define it as a reproduction of your friction ridge skin. So let's take a look at what that means. Well, what is friction ridge skin? So friction-rich skin is a distinctly different type of skin that God created for a very specific purpose. So if you just take your hand and rub the underside of your arm, you're going to see that your skin is very soft and smooth, right? This is distinctly different from your friction-rich skin. Now I want you to take your hands and rub them together. You can almost feel those raised ridges. It is distinctly different. If we look at our friction-rich skin microscopically, you're actually going to see how it almost rolls like mountains and valleys. And so because we have these mountain peaks that we call them and furrows in between, we can apply ink to that and then take a copy of your fingerprint pattern. Now, if we try to look at this just a little bit closer, uh, you're going to see these little tiny uh, dots in this photograph here, all right? These little tiny dots that are in single file on the exact copy of your fingerprint pattern. Well, those are actually your sweat pores, all right? Your sweat pores line single file the exact copy of your sweat pattern, I mean, of your friction ridge pattern. And, you know, God created us to sweat all the time, right? It's something we call involuntary. You can't look at your hand and go, I refuse to sweat, right? It happens all the time. You are constantly secreting perspiration in the form of amino acids and fatty acids from your fingerprints in the exact copy of your fingerprint all the time. So we're going to take a look at this video, and this is actually pretty amazing. What scientists have done is they have created a time-lapse movie uh, of this actually occurring on your sweat pores, and they're going to zoom in. Now, this has been sped up for us so that we can get an idea of what's occurring. Just know it doesn't happen as quickly as you see here. But look at your sweat pores, all right? You can see that these oils are being secreted all the time, all right, in the exact copy of your fingerprint pattern. And this is why every single thing you've touched, even at the museum today, if you just touched it for one second, uh, you have left behind an exact copy of your fingerprint, right? And that's why it's most, one of the most common things that we do find left behind. 
So if we take a look at friction-rich skin and where it is located on our body, God created us with friction-rich skin on two distinct places and no other on our body. And that is on the entire surface of our hands and the entire soles of your feet. This is also two of the three places on your body you also do not have hair. You can imagine if God had created us with hair on the surface of our hands or soles of our feet, it would kind of defeat the purpose of that adjective friction that they've applied to friction-rich skin because it does have a very unique purpose, right? It allows us to hold things without dropping them. It gives you almost a sandpaper, non-slip surface. You're also able to walk without slipping, right? It is on the bottom of your feet. Now, if you have sneakers on, take a look at the bottom of your shoes. What are you going to see there? You're going to see ridges, aren't you? All right. Do you think sneaker manufacturers came up with that brilliant idea first, right? Those ridges are there to give you traction, to give you grip so you don't slip when you walk. Well, no, they didn't, right? Our intelligent creator God came up with that design first on the soles of our feet, right? That actually creates a non-slip surface. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 16:4, it says, the Lord God has made everything for its purpose. And your friction skin serves a very important purpose. It gives you a non-slip surface. Now, scientists have been trying to determine, well, why does every individual get a unique set of fingerprints? Because a lot of people don't realize all 10 of your fingers are completely different. No two are the same. And all 10 of your toe prints are completely different from your fingerprints. So every single person in here has 20 unique fingerprint patterns, unlike anyone in the past, present, or going to be born in the future. Your fingerprints are unique to you, and you have 20 of them, right? And they can't explain it. There's a few theories out there that, as a forensic scientist, I don't find plausible. Uh, I prefer to look at it from a biblical worldview where, you know, God loved us so much, he gave each of you a special gift that no one else is ever going to have. Your fingerprints are yours, right? Unlike anyone else. And he gave you 20 of them, too, which is even cooler. But we do know when fingerprints develop. Fingerprints actually develop in the mother's womb between 10 and 16 weeks. This is actually an image taken by March of Dimes of a baby in its mother's womb at 11 weeks old, already has its friction skin and this beautiful world pattern that you see on its fingertip. So just to give you an idea of how big 10 weeks is, this is actually a replica of a baby at 10 weeks old. Now, I know it's probably really hard for some of you in the back to see, but that's how small it actually is at 10 weeks old. And each of you, when you were this size in your mother's womb, already had the complete set of fingerprints that you see on your hands today, given by by your creator God, a unique identity. You know, the Bible tells us in Psalms 139.14, it says, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. And your fingerprints are just one small example that God has given you a special gift that shows you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, fingerprints actually do have a very long history. If we go back to 5500 BC estimated uh, in Denmark, this is what geologists have estimated these artifacts at, uh, you can see friction-rich skin on pottery and once again 3500 BC in France. We start to find them on like monolith uh, stones where they see they that you know, the individuals living at that time must have recognized there were patterns on their fingers because we start to see it showing up uh, in carvings. If we move more into the future, we can see in 1800 BC in Babylon and all the way up to 250 AD in China, they're starting to recognize that there is some significance behind fingerprints, primarily thumbprints. They're starting to put those on seals and clay tablets showing that they recognize there was some form of identity. Do we know if they understood that each finger is different and that no two people have the same fingerprints? We don't, right? But we do recognize that there was some significance there in identifying oneself with their fingerprints. Now, moving into the 1800s, there was a gentleman named Sir Francis Galton. He was the cousin of Charles Darwin, uh, but he is actually the father of fingerprint identification and classification. He actually had one of the largest repositories ever collected a full 10 prints on over 8,000 individuals. He had a huge database. Now, his purpose of studying fingerprints, sadly, was uh, basically focused in just one direction, and he was a eugenist. 
all right? And the eugenist uh, basically is someone who's studying certain traits to determine if there is a, what he considered to be a superior race. He actually coined the term eugenics, which means well-born, all right? So that was his purpose in studying fingerprints. He said, I'm going to study all these fingerprints and determine if there is a particular fingerprint pattern that is superior to a certain race, as he coined it. So he completed almost a 10-year study of fingerprints, I classifying them by pattern and ethnicity. And at the end of his 10-year study, he actually had to conclude, well, there is no pattern specific to a certain race. They're completely random, right? Scientists can't even explain why children have completely different prints in their patterns. We don't even see commonality between parents and children in their pattern types. Uh, he actually concluded in his book, Fingerprints, in 1892, he said, it may, be, it may emphatically be said there is no peculiar pattern which characterizes persons of any of the above races. And the four that he studied at the time were English, Welsh, Hebrew, and black. There is no particular pattern that is special to any one of them, which when met with enable us to assert or even to suspect the nationality of the person, right? Well, that's exactly what we would expect to see, right? Because the Bible is very clear. In Acts 17, 26, he said he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. So we are not made up of races. We're made up of one race, the human race. Yes, we do have different cultural ethnicities and people groups, as we would call them, but we're all just one race, the human race. And that's exactly what is seen in our fingerprint patterns, as there is no commonality between any one specific ethnicity. Now, there are three types of fingerprint patterns, all right? Loops, whorls, and arches. Uh, this is for humans as well as other animal species that we're going to look at today. These are the three types of fingerprint patterns. In humans, though, the most common type of fingerprint pattern we see is a loop pattern. I actually have eight. Eight of my 10 fingers are a loop. Whorls is 30%, second most common. And the rarest type of fingerprint pattern is the arch at only 5%. So if one day you find out you have an arch, pattern, be excited. Uh, it is the rarest category. I actually have two arches of my 10 fingers. So here's what's important to consider, all right? If everyone has 20 unique fingerprint patterns and no one in here is ever going to have fingerprints that match anyone else who's ever lived, right? We're talking billions of people. What makes you unique? Why is your loop different from your loop and your loop and my loop, right? What categorizes us or makes us different from someone else? Well, that has to do with the little individual characteristics inside your fingerprint patterns, and those are called minutia. All right, minutia basically means details. So on one fingertip, so if you hold up just one finger, it doesn't matter which one, from that crease to the tip of your finger and nail to nail, you have over 150 points of minutia on just one fingerprint, all right? That is unique to you and no one else in the entire world. The location of your characteristics are special. Now, this is just five of those characteristics that you see here, ridge island, ridge ending, ridge dot. Just know there are more than this. These are the most common. But it's these little tiny characteristics that make you unique. So let's just do some math real quick, all right? So if you have 150 on just one fingertip, and you have 10 fingers, right? Multiply that in your mind by 10. Now multiply that by your 10 toes, because your toes are completely different from your fingers, right? And that's not even counting the friction ridge details on the second and third sections of your finger, or the entire palm of your hand, or the entire sole of your feet, right? I estimate every individual has over 10,000 points of minutia that are in a unique location to you, unlike anyone else, past, present, or future. So when you watch those wonderful crime scene shows, right, and they find a latent print, right, and they go and, and uh, you know, try to make a match on it, uh, there is a certain number, though, of characteristics we like to see to say with 100% certainty it is you and no one else in the entire world. And that number or that standard that we say now is 10. So in over 10,000 points of minutia that you have, it only takes 10 and theoretically, you could match less than that, okay? But 10 points is what the judge likes to see now. It is the standard. Points of minutia is enough to say it is you and no one else in the entire world. So how much is that? Well, if we take a look at what, you know, about the size of what would comprise 10 points of minutia, it is in a space of this big. It's about a one by one centimeter square is enough of a fingerprint to determine unique identity. You can fit about 10 points of minutia in that area. So you're talking a little tiny fraction of one fingerprint, right? Is enough to say to you and no one else, right? God's design is amazing and awesome and really, really cool to look at. 
So if we go back to creation week and look at, well, when would God have created friction-rich skin, all right? We can trust God's word is perfect and true, and we can go back to the book of Genesis, and we can trust it from the very first verse, right? Especially when we talk about forensic science. You know, it's important to realize any eyewitness we have in forensic science is flawed, right? We are sinful and we are imperfect. You can have 10 people observe the same crime and they'll all give a completely different account, right? Because we're just not perfect like our creator God. But when we talk about the Bible, we have the perfect eyewitness. Jesus Christ was perfect and without fault. He was there at creation, performed creation, and inspired man to record exactly what occurred during the creation week. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 1 that God created man on day six of the creation week. The Bible tells us, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created him. In his image, the only creation, right, of creation week that was made in the image of God about 6,000 years ago. So we are very special. We are unique. Our fingerprints are unique as well. But here's what's really fascinating. We are not the only creation from day six of the creation week that has raised friction skin and fingerprints. There are two main animal kinds, we would say, that do share this trait with us. They do have raised friction skin. They do have the three types of fingerprint patterns, all right? They may even uh, sweat from their sweat pores as primates do, all right? But this is not evidence of evolution because secular scientists like to use the fact that we share this trait with primates, uh, that it's, you know, evidence that we descended from a common ancestor. But that is just not the case. There are distinct differences between primates and human fingerprints. And we'll take a look at that today, as well as marsupials, because marsupials are fascinating because evolutionists actually are very confused by this and they don't know how to explain it. And I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. So as we move through this presentation, we are going to look at these from two distinct worldviews, a secular worldview and a biblical worldview. There's no doubt that our culture today is in a clash of worldviews, right? Do we believe man's imperfect worldview or do we trust God's word, perfect and true from the very first verse? All right, and so we're gonna look at this and examine these friction ridge patterns and these fingerprints that we see in marsupials and primates from these two worldviews. So let's start with man's word. So this is kind of how man likes to explain why we see friction skin in animals. And it says, to reflect evolutionary relationships, the underlying assumption is that the more features animals have in common with each other, the more closely related they are. There are several problems with this approach. One is convergent evolution. Some species evolve similar characteristics in response to similar environmental niches that they occupy. So they recognize that there's serious, serious problems with their theory, but they attribute the fact that we see marsupials and primates and humans with friction-rich skin, uh, that we kind of evolved those over millions of years because of the environment that we lived in, all right? But what does God's word say? Well, we go to Genesis, right? Genesis 1, 24 through 25 says, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kind and livestock according to their kind and everything that creeps on the ground according to their kind and God saw it was good. In fact, God tells us 10 times in Genesis 1, he made everything according to its kind just to make sure that we understood it, right? 10 times he told us that. So primates are created according to their kind, marsupials according to their kind and they reproduce within those kinds, right? We definitely see that from DNA and from uh, evidence as well. So if we take a look at primates, we're gonna start with them first, all right? And look at their friction-rich skin. We're gonna acknowledge some of the similarities we do share with them, but primarily focus on the differences. The differences far outweigh the similarities, all right? So one of the earliest studies done was in 1904 by Inez Wilder, and she studied mammalian friction-rich skin. She published a book, Laboratory Studies and Mammalian Anatomy, and she acknowledged, yes, they do have the three types of fingerprint patterns, and they do have raised friction skin. So there are three basic similarities between primates and humans, all right? One is that, yes, we do have friction skin on our hands and feet. In fact, if you look at primate skin microscopically, you can see how it rolls like mountains and valleys, just like human skin does. They do have the three types of fingerprint patterns, arches, loop, and whorl. And they do have minutia, or those details that make you unique, on all their friction surfaces, all right? Similar to humans, but they are distinctly different, and we'll take a look at that. 
Scientists go on to say the striking similarities in dermal ridge patterns between human and non-human subjects have allowed for the same landmark and ridge count methods to be used for comparative studies. All right? So it's important that primates do share this trait because now we're able to study theirs and then apply somewhat of what we learn to human friction ridge skin, even though we're going to look at all the distinct differences today. But when we have comparative studies, we just call that homology. All right? Now, homology is the state of having the same or similar relationship relative position or structure all right God made us with hearts and lungs and eyes and he made primates with hearts and lungs and eyes right and he made marsupials with those same features all right we just call that homology it's just evidence that we have a common creator designer who gave us exactly what we need to survive in the environment that he created for us to live in our founder and CEO Ken Ham going on to say it makes sense that God used the same basic design for all kinds of different creatures after all he did make us to live in the same world eat the the same food and breathe the same air, right? So we shouldn't be surprised we see friction skin as well in primates and marsupials because it would benefit them, right? It's a non-slip surface. Would these creatures benefit from having a non-slip surface in their environment? Absolutely. Now, the differences between primates and humans far exceed those three similarities that I gave you. Uh, 1943, Cummins and Midlow published a series of research, and this is one of the largest studies ever done on primate specimens, and that was the chimpanzee. They studied hundreds of chimpanzee specimens, looked at their fingerprints, and what they did is they created a density of ridge analysis for primates. And what basically what scientists do, because we're going to look at this a couple times through the remainder of the presentation, is they take a one centimeter line and a scientist will count the number of ridges in that line and they'll assign a number to a particular species and they call it the density of ridges. And what they have found is that chimpanzees have finer ridges than humans. And you can almost see that in this picture side by side, meaning that our ridges are thicker, therefore we don't have as much in the same distance as primates do. Another distinct difference is in our uh, dependent arch patterns. Right? Remember I said arches are the rarest at 5%, but uh, primates do have a prevalence of peaked tenant arches, and that is a distinct difference. Scientists go on to say, on the fingertips, the ridges form distinct tenant arch patterns, which are clearly different from human ones. They are much longer and possess a well-defined central ridge or set of ridges, all right? A distinct difference, and you can see that in that primate pattern right here, there is a peaked tenant arch, all right? Much different from a humid tenant arch. Another distinct difference that we see is that primates do have long curved fingers, as you can see right here in this gray langer. Scientists go on to say, each hand features four fingers in addition to a posable thumb, but the human fingers are shorter and flatter. Primates' long curved fingers assist with the animal's ability to swing through the trees. The longer human thumb would be a hindrance for primates, getting in the way of the hook-like grass they need for swinging from trees. Just the design of our hands is distinctly different, all right? Once again, God created us exactly the way we needed to be to survive in our different, uh, you decide within our environment, within our created kind. Also, we see this in lemurs, all right? Lemurs as well have beautiful friction skin, as you can see here, and primates actually have what we call a low occurrence of minutia complexity. Humans have one of the highest variations of minutia complexity, and that basically is those differences that I was telling you about right here, that ridge ending, ridge island, that's minutia complexity. Well, primates don't have the variety that humans do, all right? Only humans have this level of complexity that we see. And so primates, though they do have minutia, it is distinctly different from humans. You're just not going to see as much of them. Another distinct difference between primates and humans is in their pattern distribution. All right, remember I said in humans, the most common type of pattern we have is a loop, 65%, right, of human fingerprints are loops. Well, in primates, it is the whorl. 65% of all primate fingerprint patterns are some type of whorl pattern, and the loop is the second at 30%. Another distinct difference we see uh, in the orangutan and other primates as well is something we call a peaked tendon arch, right? Or loop, as I just stated a little bit earlier. And they also have a second set of fingerprint patterns on their proximal joints. So if we take a look at, well, where exactly is that? You can see it is on this section right here. They're actually going to have a second set of fingerprints, right? A trait we do not see in humans, distinctly different. 
Now, one of the major differences that you can see, and you can always identify a primate versus a human fingerprint, is in the density of ridge analysis, all right? So when we look at density of ridges, the dense ridge breadth of a human, right, is going to be thicker than that of a primate. They have a finer ridge breadth. So because of that, on average, humans have about 11 ridges per centimeter. All right, that's like our density of ridge average. And primates are about 22. Now this can vary slightly between primate species, but just know this is like the average that they have concluded for primates. And they have replicated the study from Cummins in the early 1900s till recently today, uh, continuing to try and find commonality between primates and humans. And there just isn't any. Our density of ridge analysis is distinctly different. And so our ridges are about 10 different. They go on to say human fingerprints have a higher ridge density than primate fingerprints. And all through secular scientific literature, they have to admit that there are distinct differences between humans and primates. Now, another area, not just on the fingertips do we see differences, but on the palms as well. Now, there are three distinct areas of your palm that scientists study, the interdigital, the thenar, and the hypothenar, like you see up here. So the first major difference we're going to look at is in the interdigital whorls, right? That area is going to be this area that's circled right up here, okay? It is very, very prevalent in primates to find whorls in this area. There's a less than 1% chance in humans, right? Extremely rare, and that would be this area under your fingers right here. Very, very common to have whorls, as you see in this picture, for primates. Another distinct difference is something we call the hypothenar whorl. Now, the hypothenar whorl is in this quadrant down here on your palm, all right? Prevalent in primates. You can see it in this example I have here. There's five whorls on this palm. This is a trait you are not going to see in humans, right? There's even a less than 1% chance of humans even going to have a whorl in this area, not to mention five on the palm like you see here. Very, very significant for a primate. Now, another major difference on the palmar area is in that friction skin, those minutia characteristics that I told you about. They're going to have less specialization, less variety. And you can almost see that in that beautiful gibbon palm print that you have here. Uh, the ridges flow almost in a singular, straight direction. You don't see a lot of stopping or forking in those little details I told you about, like we see in human prints. Another major difference, uh, we're just going to talk about the three key ones again very quickly, is that very short thumb that we do see in primates, as you can see here, that's what they would need to have that hook-like grass to swing through the trees. Also in those palmar whorls and in those rare hypothenar whorls, three distinct differences not going to see in humans. Now here's what's really cool, because God's amazing, is he created uh, certain primates with friction-rich skin, not just on the surface of their hands and feet, but also on on their prehensile tail. So there is a spider monkey native to Central America that on its prehensile tail or running on the entire length of the underside of its tail, as you see here, it has raised friction skin and has a tail print pattern. And scientists have now printed 12 of these monkeys and found no two tail prints are the same. So their tail print is unique to them as well as their hands and feet. You know, the Bible tells us in Psalms 104, 24, it says, O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In your wisdom you have made them all, and the earth is full of your creatures, right? So how cool is it that we can find friction-rich skin also on prehensile tails? And here's what's really amazing if we look at this uh, from a biblical worldview. This monkey, as you see here in the picture, uses its tail primarily to hold onto branches, and it wraps the tail around the branch while it's feeding. Would a non-slip surface on this particular monkey benefit them in their environment? Well, sure it would. That friction skin gives them a non-slip surface to wrap around that branch so it doesn't slip when it's eating. So if we take a look at primate prints from a secular worldview and a biblical worldview, well, a secular worldview wants you to believe that, they, that you have raised friction skin and fingerprints. It says an increased friction rate between fingertips and grip surface would benefit human ancestors as well. These hominins, which live primarily in trees, that would be your early ancestors that they're referring to there, would use these unique grooves to help them grasp branches. This idea is supported by the evidence of fingerprints and some Homo sapiens' closest living relatives the chimp and gorilla. In fact, it is likely that fingerprints are an attribute evolutionary acquired by animals with an arboreal lifestyle. Now, arboreal means tree dwelling. And so a secular scientist is trying to tell you that, well, primates have fingerprints and you have fingerprints because our early ancestors lived in trees and they must have just developed them to help them with the non-slit surface. 
never referring to the fact we all have unique identity, right? So it's just, uh, they just can't explain it. But if we look at this from a biblical worldview, once again, as I said in Genesis 1, God tells us 10 times that he created everything according to his kind and reproduces according to its kind. So we shouldn't be surprised that not only does he provide us with everything we need to survive in our environment with a purpose, right? But he created us according to our kind and we can trust Genesis. God's word is perfect and true and we can trust that primates were created distinct with certain features that they needed within their created kind. Now, once in a while, uh, secular science and biblical worldview do align, and they actually came out with a very interesting quote about human skin. Uh, secular scientist Montagno, who's like a guru in uh, human skin, uh, said, without a doubt, man has the most exquisitely sensory skin of all animals and thus is better aware of his environment, right? Well, that's exactly what we'd expect to see because the Bible tells us God created man in his own image and the image of God he created him. So we would expect that the pinnacle of God's creation has the most sensory skin out there created. How amazing. So now let's dive into marsupials, all right? When we talk about marsupials, there are two distinct categories that they fall into. One is terrestrial or land-dwelling and arboreal or tree-dwelling, because we are gonna see distinct differences here in our marsupials based on where they primarily live and whether or not they have friction-rich skin, because not all marsupials do, all right? But let's start with the koala, all right? Koalas do have raised friction skin and fingerprints, all right? In fact, a human and koala's friction-rich skin, the structure and morphology of that skin, as you can see here in this microscopic view, is almost identical. It's so identical that if a koala was to leave its fingerprints behind at a crime scene, you would not be able to tell the difference because they look exactly like ours. Their density of ridge analysis is almost identical to ours. Fingerprints of a koala are virtually indistinguishable of, from those of human. So there are some similarities between human and koala. They do share the three types of fingerprint patterns, just as primates do. They do have minutiae characteristics, okay? They also share that density of ridges I told you about. Remember, humans is about 11. We're gonna see the chart with koala, it's about 12. And they do have almost the same microscopic structure as humans. Side by side here, you can see that they are almost identical. So if we take a look at that density of ridge analysis, they have done just one study on this, comparing it to human and chimpanzee, but you can see where the koala, their density of ridge analysis was about 12.35, whereas human is 11. So we are almost identical to the point you would not be able to tell them apart, all right? So if we go on to look some more at this koala, here's the problem with this, all right? Each koala does have distinctly different fingerprint patterns from any other koala. One of the main differences we see between koala and human, though, is that they do not have friction-rich skin on their palmar area, and you can almost see that here. They do have friction-rich skin on their digits, on the end of their digits, but not on that entire palmar area. So it is a distinct difference that we see. So in humans, some of the differences, friction skin covers, as I said, our entire hands and feet in humans, but in the koala, friction skin is only on the tips of fingers and the thumbs and small sections of the palm, but it does not cover the entire surface. And another distinct difference we see is that the arch pattern, which is only 5% in humans, it's very rare, almost covers completely the entire koala. In fact, if we take a look at it here, all right, you're gonna see this beautiful arch pattern on this koala's digit tip right here, distinctly unique, and they have several of them, almost to the point where scientists have actually observed arches in all of their digits. Now here's the issue, all right, because this poses a serious problem for evolutionists, and the fact that koala have raised friction skin and fingerprints, and the fact that they're almost identical to humans is a question they just can't answer, all right? So if you're looking at this from an evolutionary perspective, uh, then you would have to believe that we all descended, right, from one cell into the complexity and variety that we see today, all right? And so there is one tree of life, as you see represented in this diagram, all right? The issue is, is that the koala, right, which has almost identical fingerprints to human. In fact, think about it for a second. Have you ever heard anywhere on TV or in any science article you read that you are descended from a koala? No, right? It just doesn't fit. They say primate, but they never say koala, all right? Well, koala and primates are actually separated on this evolutionary tree by 70 million years. And they're perplexed because they say, why would a koala, which has raised friction skin and fingerprints almost identical to human, on a different branch of this tree, right? 
the koala is going to be on a different branch than the primate. All right? It's not going to be on the same branch. Okay? Have almost identical fingerprints to humans. All right, and they just can't answer it. In fact, they go on to say, koala fingerprints are somewhat of a scientific mystery. Apes such as gorillas and chimpanzees are evolutionary speaking, a lot closer to humans than koalas. Koalas are not exactly anywhere near those particular evolutionary branches. So they're just confused. They don't know how to explain it, right? But would a koala benefit from restriction skin and fingerprints? Absolutely, right? They would benefit from having that feature because it gives them a non-slip surface. Koala climb trees, koala hold their food, they grass food as well. Having that trait is going to benefit them. So from a biblical worldview, it is not an issue at all. It's just even more amazing because God made them all unique and made them almost identical to ours as well. So if we take a look at the fact that koalas have raised friction skin and fingerprints from secular worldview and a biblical worldview, if you look at this from a secular worldview, you're going to have to believe that koalas and humans diverged around 125 to 150 million years ago, but both share remarkably similar fingerprints. Marsupials that are no by means closely related to primate have similar fingerprints to humans, right? They're baffled and they can't explain it. And they continue to say in their research, we hope to have a bridge in the future. We hope to find more research to fill that gap. Uh, but we know looking at God's word, they can keep looking as they won't find anything, right? God created us unique and according to our kind. So we look at it from a biblical worldview. Once again, Genesis tells us God created everything according to its kind. We can trust God's word, perfect and true. And koalas and marsupials are distinctly within a separate kind than primates. Now, what's really cool is koalas aren't the only primate with raised friction skin and fingerprints. The opossum, the opossum does as well. They do have raised friction skin. In fact, if we take a look at it closely, we can see the raised friction skin, and they have a beautiful world pattern. No two possum have the same fingerprint patterns, all right? Their fingertips have friction ridges in patterns like a human fingerprint. Now, what's distinctly different about a possum is that they have these raised areas on their paws, like you can see here. And they only have a pattern on the tip of those little raised areas on their paws and on the tips of their fingers. They're not going to quite have the level of detail that we do on the entire surface. They go on to say friction ridges or fingerprints are present on the plantar undersurfaces of both of the feet and hind feet that aid in providing a firmer grip, right? Raised friction skin gives you a non-slip surface. Would opossums benefit from that? Sure, right? They climb, they hold their food. Having a non-slip surface is going to greatly benefit that creature. Now, if we look at wallaby and kangaroo, now these are land-dwelling marsupial, right? Koala and possums climb, right? Though possums may live in burrows and things like that, they do climb, so having a feature like that is going to help them. But wallabies and kangaroos don't climb and are pretty much primarily land-dwelling. Uh, so if we take a look at kangaroos, what we find is that land-dwelling marsupials lack fingerprints, okay? So this is actually fingerprints taken from our baby kangaroo at the Ark Encounter, who I printed a couple weeks ago. Her name is Emerald, and you can see she does not have any type of friction ridge pattern. Now, she does have a raised texture, like you can see there, but there is no minutia here. There is no way to distinguish identity. There are no fingerprint patterns here, all right? We can also see this when compared to her mother. Her mother's name is Nema, and if you ever go down to the Ark Encounter, which I'm sure some of you are tomorrow, uh, our new wallaby kangaroo walkthrough exhibit will be open, and you will be able to actually see Nema and Emerald out there, and you can actually take a look at their um, you know, if you get a chance to uh, take a look at their little feet and just know that on the underside, they don't have raised friction skin, they do not have fingerprints, all right? Now, our zoo team does an excellent job uh, doing uh, animal enrichment with our animals, and we take very good care of them. You can actually see here, uh, after they gave us their little uh, paw prints, we actually were able to give them treats and special things that they like to eat uh, as a reward. Uh, and so our zoo team is a big help in uh, helping me get these print patterns that you're looking at. Now, what's interesting is though land-dwelling kangaroos do not have raised friction skin, there is one that does, and that is the tree kangaroo. Tree, tree kangaroos who live primarily in trees, in fact, they live so high up in these particular trees in Papua New Guinea that researchers have a very, very difficult time even studying them. But the few that they have captured, they have verified that sure enough, 
And like fingerprints, their pattern is unique to each animal and they have opposable digits. So they do have race friction skin and fingerprint patterns. All right. Now, what about the wallaby? All right. Well, wallabies are land dwelling and they do lack fingerprints. And you can actually see those paw prints from Skippy here. Skippy sadly uh, has passed on, uh, but we do have Boomer and Bam Bam out in the petting zoo today at the Creation Museum if you go out there. And I do have Boomer's prints right here from 2019. And so once again, our wallabies love peanut butter, so they'll put some little peanut butter down there and they get to eat peanut butter while they're taking their paw prints. Uh, but very cute, we can see once again, they do not have raised friction skin, they do not have fingerprint patterns. But what's interesting is the rock wallaby does, all right? The rock wallaby is a climbing wallaby. So once again, God gave them exactly what they needed to survive. They have a non-slip surface. They have reduced claws and they have highly developed transverse ridges at the ends of their toes, much like a human fingerprint, all right? So once again, we see this unique quality. Uh, and what's really amazing, we think about it, not only did he give them friction ridge skin, but he gave them unique identity, right? He gave all of these creatures unique identity. Now there is another marsupial, all right, that does have raised friction skin and fingerprint patterns, and those are sugar gliders, all right? So this is Gabriel from the Ark Encounter. And so if you go down there uh, on the second deck, they usually have an animal encounter for you, and you might get to meet Gabriel. He's one of the animals that they use for those animal encounters. Uh, and this is actually his little paw print here that he gave us. Now that's the only one we've been able to get successfully. You can imagine they are very, very small, and they are nocturnal, and they, he doesn't like to come out too much. So it's very difficult, but he does have beautiful Beautiful friction skin. In fact, you can see it right here, highlighted with the ink. Beautiful paw print patterns with no two sugar gliders having the same fingerprints as well. Once again, they would climb and a non-slip surface would benefit this creature in their environment. Now, there is a carnivore that has fingerprints. In fact, it is the only carnivore known to have fingerprints, and that is the Fisher weasel, all right? And you can see on his palm here, this beautiful world pattern has formed. In fact, uh, it was forest rangers who were the first ones to recognize this because they would leave their paw prints behind uh, in the dirt, and the forest rangers started to recognize there were patterns there, and they started to be able to identify the Fisher weasel based on those patterns left behind and start to assign numbers to them. Uh, and so what they found is, sure enough, as we would expect, no two have the same, and they do climb, and having a non-slip surface is going to benefit this creature. So if we look at this from secular worldview and a biblical worldview, marsupials, all right? Secular worldview would tell you the presence of derma dermatoglyphic patterns very similar to human ones in animals, even as remote from ourselves as marsupials, may be an example of independent evolution of the same skin adaption to climbing, right? That's the only conclusion they can come to is that they must have developed friction skin almost exactly like humans that we see in koala and other marsupials because they were climbing and they must have adapted to that. But if we look at this from a biblical worldview, right? God tells us that he made everything for its purpose, right? And so every single creature that does have raised friction skin and fingerprints is there for a very specific reason. It needs that non-slip surface to survive in its environment. And then God just went one step further and said, I'm gonna give you unique identity as well. So as I said, it's a clash of world cultures, right? It's a clash of biblical worldview versus man's worldview. You know, the Bible tells us in Colossians 2.8, it says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ, right? There is no doubt that many of our students and our families, not even our churches, are being taken captive, right, by empty philosophy, right, and deceit, right, by telling us that we're descended from a primate ancestor uh, and trying to convince us that we, you know, that we evolved over millions of years in death and suffering. But we can trust God's word. It's perfect and true. And we've looked at those main differences today. And you have just a little piece of information to take with you if you ever get into conversation with someone about why the fact primates have friction skin and fingerprint patterns. Because you know, crea creation is evidence of our creator. And it tells us in Romans 1.20, it says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, right? So they are without excuse. Creation points back to our creator. And you've seen just a small example of that today in the marsupial and primate patterns that we've looked at. 
So I'm going to conclude with just highlighting a few of the resources that we do offer here at the Creation Museum and provide you with a special that you get today for coming to this workshop. So we do have something called the Answers Insider. Uh, it is a free newsletter, newsletter that comes in your mail, and you can also get a free digital download if you sign up for that today, The Fire in My Bones, which is the testimony of our founder and CEO, Ken Ham. We also have Glass House out there. Glass House is our latest book on sharing the myth of evolution. I do have two chapters in this book. One chapter focuses on the difference between observational and historical science and how we look at that from the forensic science viewpoint. Also available for you in the lobby is The Work of Your Hand. Uh, this is a book that came out in January, and I wrote it uh, for children. So if you want to teach your kids a little bit about what you learned today, how do we study fingerprints, how can we learn the three types of fingerprint patterns from a biblical worldview, I highly would recommend you pick up the book. It also has a section in the back for the children to put their handprints and footprints uh, so that you can record that information for them, and then they can actually classify their pattern types. We also have available The Lie. The Lie next to the Bible is the heart of the ministry. Uh, it just celebrated recently its 25th anniversary edition, uh, but this goes into great depth about the clash of the cultures we've been talking about, and the clash of worldviews, and the compromise that we've seen not only in our schools and our churches, but also in our families, all right? And so it's an important book. Highly recommend you pick that up, as well as Gospel Reset. Gospel Reset reviews the book of Genesis and how it is essential to understanding the gospel and salvation only through Jesus Christ. Another set of books I highly recommend you pick up and definitely don't leave without these is the Answers Book 1 through 4. We answer over 100 top questions that the ministry receives from carbon dating to distant starlight. Where did Cain get his wife, right? Top questions that we receive all the time answered for you from a biblical worldview in Answers Book 1 through 4. We also have the Flood of Evidence, often called Answers Book 5, which is going to take an in-depth look at Noah's flood, the size of the ark, how could Noah have fit all the animals on the ark, and how do we view the fossil evidence from the global flood. We also have Andrew's book for teens, volume one and volume two, and we do have it for children as well, and that does come in a box set like you see here. All right? One Race, One Blood takes a look at the issue of race from a biblical worldview, as well as many different children's books. A is for Adam, N is for Noah, and also D is for Dinosaur. We also have a One Blood for Kids, right, discussing that race issue with children. Highly recommend this book. It really shows in that we're all just one race, the human race, and it actually goes into explaining why we have different skin colors and how we look at that genetically. Dinosaurs for Kids as well, written by Ken Ham, excellent book on explaining, well, how do dinosaurs fit into the Bible, right? One of the main questions that kids have. So we do have a special for you today, three for 35, five for 55, 10 for 95, 15 for 129, or 30 for 199, just for you and for coming to the Creation Museum today. We also highly recommend Answers Magazine. It's one of my favorite magazines to get in the mail. I do read it cover to cover. You get six family magazines, plus in every single magazine you get the kids in insert that you see here. If you described, subscribe today, uh, you're also going to receive the digital version of that, which is searchable. So if you're looking for a very specific topic, you can search that. It'll take you directly to that in the magazine. Now, as you saw highlighted before the talk, uh, we do have a partnership with PureFlix, and we highly uh, recommend that you sign up for PureFlix if you're looking for that clean version of Netflix, something you don't have to be afraid to turn on with your children. Uh, signing up with PureFlix does include 12 months of movie streaming. It includes all of the Answers in Genesis videos. It also has live streaming of Answers in Genesis program, which is coming in the fall of 2019. You also get the annual subscription to the Answers magazine, which you'll get in your mail every eight weeks if you sign up for PureFlix, as well as that digital uh, subscription we were talking about. And you're also going to get eight digital downloads for free included with that, all for, I believe it's $99. We also have the Foundation's Curriculum Kit, so if you're looking to bring this information, everything you learned here at the Ark Encounter and Creation Museum to your church or small group, we recommend the Foundation's, uh, which is available for you for $69 today as well. We also have Begin out there. Now, if you have uh, a non-believer or someone you've really been trying to reach to and you just don't want to hand them the entire Bible, we do have this wonderful book called Begin that does include Genesis 1 through 11 with some commentary. It's going to have portions of the Bible, Exodus, portions of John, 
part, portions of Romans talking about the salvation message and how uh, to have salvation through Jesus Christ, ending with Revelation chapters 21 and 22. And then at the end of the book, it does cover these 10 topics that you see here, some of the top controversial topics that people are searching for biblical answers to can be answered in this book. And you can get this book today for just $3. We also have our pocket guides. There are over 19 topics that you see here in just $2 each, small little versions of the information uh, that you receive in our other materials that you can take with you. I often have bought these in big sets before and handed them out to people. We also have a conference, our pastor's conference coming up, One Race, One Blood in October, uh, and you can sign up for that and recommend to your pastors that they sign up and come to that conference. And we also have our women's conference next year, Truth Uncovering the Lies We Believe. I've attended the last few years. I can tell you it is excellent, ladies. I highly recommend get the ladies in your church together, come as a group, and enjoy those two days that we spend here together down at the Answer Center, learning the truth of God's Word. So thank you so much for coming today, and enjoy the rest of your day at the Creation Museum.